Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 40 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. With me right now is Shane Partlow. Shane is a former non-commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps who served an assistant attache in the Def U.S. Defense Attaché Office at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv, Ukraine from 2011 until 2014. During the tumultuous events of 2014, which led to the fall of the Ukrainian government, Shane was at ground zero reporting back to the U.S. government minute by minute as protests grew, as government forces cracked down, and eventually as Russian troops suddenly and unexpectedly occupied parts of the country, and his mission changed from observing a revolution to observing a Russian invasion. My conversation with Shane turned into my longest interview yet, so for the first time, we've decided to break this interview into two parts. Part two will be available on Monday, April 11th, 2022. But before we get into Shane's story, I wanna let you all know about a new educational tool you're not going to want to miss. It's the Gray Man Briefing Classified. By now, I think I know my listeners pretty well, and take it from me, this briefing is exactly the news and educational reference source that you've been looking for. You'll get breaking news updates from all over the world on topics including planned protests and riots, low intensity conflicts, natural disaster alerts, cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, and more. You'll also get access to articles that help you build your own skills, including urban survival, home security, counter surveillance, escape and evasion techniques, and more. And this is much more than just a newsletter in your inbox. Joining the Gray Man Briefing Classified also includes invitation-only channels on the Telegram and Signal apps for convenient real-time updates. The newsletter subscription is normally $5 per month, but if you use the code GBC Spycraft, you can save 20% each month for the life of your subscription. I'm already a member myself and have been reading and learning a lot since I first subscribed. Look it up yourself at graymanbriefing.com. That's gray with an A, graymanbriefing.com and use the discount code GBC Spycraft to save 20% right from the start. Shane, thank you for sitting down with me today. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. I, I honestly can't think of anybody else I'd rather talk to right now, considering the ongoing events in Ukraine at this very moment. Yeah, uh, it's been quite a trip down memory lane for sure. Looking back over all my prior notes, all the old research, just everything going on. It, it's really, it's, it's quite a time to, to be looking through it all. I can imagine. And I think that a lot of people are really looking forward to the perspective from somebody who has been there, spent several years on the ground, somebody that they would probably consider a more trustworthy source than any partisan or heavily involved sources right now. So I'm, I'm really glad that we finally got the chance to sit down. Of course. Yeah. I'd, as an unbiased observer, I'm glad to lend any insight into the events going on for sure. Great. So to begin with, you are the first person from the attache office that I've talked to. So can you talk a little bit about what a defense attache or in your case, an assistant attache is? Sure. So, you know, overall, the, the defense attache office is a team within just about every embassy, U.S. embassy around the world. DAOs. So the DAO is the, the whole office. And then there's you know, a lot of other terms used for the person, like the DAT is the defense attache, and then there's the other service attaches, assistant attaches, support staff, and going down the line. Principally, the DAO serves to advise the ambassador and the country team, which is the makeup of all other U.S. government officials, senior leaders in the embassy on the ground. And we provide overall defense and security matter advice, as well as reporting back timely and accurate information back to U.S. senior leaders on events happening in Ukraine and as well as in the region. Normally there's every service is represented, but some offices aren't as large as others. So there's sometimes not all services represented, but in, in Kyiv, we did have all services represented. We had a, a fairly sizable office. Yeah. And so for me there, I was uh, credited as an assistant attache there. We had quite a few support staff, so we can get into a little bit more of kind of the differences between some of those roles as well. Yeah, I was just going to ask you as an NCO, how did your role differ from the DAT, for example? Yeah, so it depends overall on which office you're going to be in. You and I was a bit of a special case. The Marine Corps 
is the only service which had a, a prerequisite for your job type, your military occupational specialty for fulfilling those duty assignments for the NCOs. And that was CI human. And then on case by case, they would take perhaps an analyst or perhaps a SIG enter, but it was almost exclusively counterintelligence, human intelligence, Marines who would go. So all I can really say is I was a little bit different in that regard, but typically in most DAOs, you know, the NCOs, they're the backbone as they are everywhere else in the military, right? Where they, they serve to, to manage the daily operations of the DAOs for which they are accredited to. And specifically for me, my duties were not really all that different from any of the other officers there. I was the partnership for peace program chief in Ukraine. So one of the main missions of a defense attache office is to carry out and support events of military cooperation, assisting the offensive defense cooperation that is there, as well as other military to military training events, multinational events. That was the main, the center lane of my portfolio. So what I did as partnership for peace program manager was to plan, pay for authorized payments to be expended as well as participate in the major military exercises there, rapid trident, sea breeze, many other military cooperation events. Oh, wow. So a lot of liaison. And then is that what I'm understanding correctly with foreign militaries? Yes. The main exercises that happened there were co-hosted between the U.S. and Ukraine. So mainly we'd work with the Department of International Cooperation, Ministry of Defense for Ukraine, and cooperate with those partners to figure out the details, logistics, the plan, the objectives to achieve during the exercises we would have there. But then also we would bring in all the other participants. A lot of other major European nations were participants. You know, we always had Germany, Germany had an exchange officer always in UCOM that would come out as well. First year, we actually had Belarusians. That was an interesting one. So mm -hmm. we had Belarusians there the first year, along with the Polish are always there, Lithuanians, Georgia usually attends as well, usually on the Navy side, but lots of different countries. Mainly it's partnership for peace nations, which are, it's essentially former Warsaw Pact with a couple of other exceptions. And then there was always your random observers. Sometimes we'd have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Kuwait, some Middle Eastern countries that would come and observe as well. Hmm. Sounds like that's a, a lot of interesting stuff going on at all times, no matter what then. Oh yeah. It was constant. I mean, with two major exercises, you're either, you're either planning for the next one or executing the current one. I mean, there's really not a lot of downtime in between them. Hmm. I can imagine. So did you volunteer for this position or were you selected or what? Can you take us through the pipeline to actually make it into the DAO? Sure. So it's a little bit different than, than it is now. It was, it was really by word of mouth when I was coming in. The ascension process for the NCOs was, like I said earlier, almost exclusively in the intelligence disciplines within the Marine Corps and specifically within CI and human. So we had a, a list that would go around, we called it the hot fill list, and it would just say the, the various billets that were coming up open that needed to be fulfilled for external Marine Corps engagement. And that's, there's a lot of billets that are on that list. And one of them was being in Kyiv, Ukraine as the defense attache system representative. And it was honestly not really on my mind prior to looking at that list of what I really wanted to do next. I just knew that I didn't want to go back to Iraq on another back-to-back. -back. I just completed my fourth tour, two back-to-back -back deployments, and, and Iraq was really slowing down at the time too. So I was looking to keep the excitement up and, and do something new and interesting. So I just simply emailed our career manager that I wanted to do this. There were a series of required paperwork that had to be submitted to DIA. And then it was just the big waiting game. And the timing was just kind of perfect for me. I, I was back off deployment, sitting on base and, and applied and was, was selected. I can't really speak to exactly what the Marine Corps takes into account other than what they say publicly is just the general sense of a good Marine, as well as a you know, myriad of language, cultural and regional experience. And today the process is a lot more formalized. You can find them for the Marine Corps via Marine admin messages, which are publicly available messages that state plainly in the subject that it's for the attache program. Okay. Okay. That, that sounds more straightforward than I anticipated. Do you think this was like a, like a hotly contested billet? I mean, did a lot of people want to go to, to Kiev at that time? At the time? No. I mean, I think, I think the list was, it had that vacancy on it for a couple of months and I was the first one to apply. Now, remember, like I said earlier, it was, it was a lot less formal and it was exclusive to our community and in the Marine Corps, the, the CI human community at that time was pretty small. 
The active contingent within the fleet was only like maybe 200 to 300 total. Oh, wow. And of that, you weren't, you, you weren't really eligible to even look at the hot fill list, let alone be considered for any billet on the hot fill list, unless you had served a couple of deployments as a CI human Marine. So the, the pool of candidates that would have even known that was a possibility was quite small. Hmm. So did you have any Ukrainian or Russian language capability beforehand, or did they train you beforehand or anything? Yeah. So I didn't have any language experience, but I did definitely have a, a longstanding intrigue with Slavic and Russian history. The language definitely intrigued me. And for this posting, I did go to language training for it. DIA is the hosting and funding agency that manages the defense attache system, which is actually now called the defense attache service, went under a name change mm. a few years back. So the course that you go through there, it's a 13 week course. Everyone goes through the joint military attache school. And then there's some follow on safety and security training, as well as some language training that you can attend if you have time. And as I said earlier, everything just kind of worked out timing wise. So the Marine who was there at the time was able and very willing to extend for an additional year. And that gave me the time to go ahead and take Russian language for about a year prior to going out to Kiev. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. That must've come in really handy in that case, an entire year of training. It, it certainly did. You know, it's, it's a level four language. So DLI standards for that language at the full-time course in Monterey, it's an 18 month course. So I got about half of that at about half of the time. Yeah. Still that, I'm sure that prepared you a lot. It was still very useful. Yes. So you arrived in 2011 and of course, we're going to talk about the protests and the conflict, but what was life like there when you first arrived? I know that you said you were professionally busy, but was it like a good place for your family? I mean, did you enjoy the culture and everything right off the bat? Oh yeah. And yeah, it was, it was really great. The timing was not as great getting there as it was applying and being accepted. You know, my wife and I had just recently gotten married we were both active duty. She was going to separate soon. And, you know, there's, there was no way for her to go out there on orders as an active duty member. Cause it's, it was, there's no plus one billet for mm. the Marine Corps out there. So we had to wait for her to separate. So I was out there for about four or five months before she was able to, to come out with me after she had separated and we didn't have a kid at the time. And Kiev was just an awesome town to be in, especially in the, in the early days when we got there, it was. I mean, English language wasn't really that prolific on the streets. So I really got a great time to use, practice Russian language skill, be indoctrinated a little bit more to Ukrainian language, which is not, was not quite as prolific in Kiev at the time, but gaining popularity as time went on. And yeah, it's just amazing. When my wife got there, she was hired by the embassy almost immediately as a community liaison officer, which is a pretty coveted billet for, for spouses and embassies. It's the one job it's called really the, the party planner. So that person in the embassy, you know, they're a state department employee. They work in the embassy, they're a country team member and everything. And their goal is to just make sure that the inclusiveness of the entire embassy community is, is regarded. There are events happening to cater to both families with children families without children, as well as single members of the, of the embassy community. And she had a great time doing that. And we were able to just do so much throughout the town and throughout the country while we were there. There's always the, the Marine Corps security guards always kind of have the best, the best parties in town, at least back <laughs> then. Yeah, you know, it was always great. And the setup we had in Kiev was amazing because we had the chancery, which is where the bulk of the senior staff and, and kind of the core diplomatic staff of the embassy was. And then down the street, maybe three or four blocks, there was an annex that had the Marine house and the consular section. And then there was another annex a couple of blocks away that had some of the other support staff, but the Marine house was really the place to be. It was on a, it was on a pretty main street, a little bit outside the, the central downtown district, but not far at all. And we had some great times there. Unfortunately, I think, I believe now the Marine Corps has stepped in and it's full fun police fashion. And I don't think alcohol is allowed at Marine houses anymore. <laughs> oh and, and parties are essentially just a no go. So that was kind of a couple of years ago. I heard from a, a, an MSG Marine telling me what, what the situation was. So probably not as good now as it used to be, but yeah, the life, life in Kiev and Ukraine was, was amazing. The, the culture, the history is just amazing. You know, you have to remember that world war two was fought in this country. 
So when you go there, if you're a big history buff, and, and I am indeed, especially for World War II, known as the Great Patriotic War there, the amount of artifacts and the clarity of information they have in their museums is just amazing. If, if anyone ever gets a chance to go to Kyiv, one of the places you've got to go is the Museum of the Great Patriotic War. And it's, it's uh, got the, one of the biggest statues in, in the city is the, the, the maiden that stands over Kiev and she's holding a sword and a shield. It's one of the most prominent statues in the city. And that's the center of the, that museum. And the culture that is shared there is just absolutely amazing. And, and really the people there are Ukraine's best asset. I mean, it's amazing to be able to think that you're in a former Soviet country and it's really difficult to communicate with the people if you don't have a, a good understanding of Russian or Ukrainian. And my wife certainly did not. She did not get the language training prior to going out. You know, many times she would ride public transportation around town, get into the embassy, whatever it might be. And on more than one occasion, she would step onto a bus and, and it was a cash system there. So you had to hand over cash to the attendant on the bus and she'd get in on like the back of the bus. She would hand forward a hundred Kurivna bill, their currency. A uh, hundred at the time was worth maybe like $12, $13, nothing too much. That bill would be passed between the hands of like six or seven people going up to the front to the attendant. It would be given to the attendant. And then the attendant would, and it was only five Hrivna to ride the bus. So then she would change out 95 and pass the change back through these six or seven people that were in between my wife and the attendant. And every single time the hundred made it up there and the change made it back. Can wow. you imagine what would happen in New York city if you tried that? <laughs> yeah, that's a very telling anecdote there. I, I would not have expected yeah. that. Yeah, Fantastic. no no way would you even, that that bill would not, I mean, let's say it's like a $20 bill equivalency there, Like, but it wouldn't get past like the second person. Mm -hmm. So really like that's one of the best stories I tell for like just kind of explaining kind of the mindset and the character of a Ukrainian slash, you know, Kiev in person that's it there in, in Kiev. And at that time, you know, the government was quite oppressive to freedom and and, and the people always just felt it was standard. Like they were always getting ripped off by the government. They were always being oppressed by the government in some way. So they really didn't feel a need to go after one another. They were already getting taken by the government. So they shouldn't be taking from one another. And we'll get into a little bit more of what, how that played into the revolution. But yeah, the country is amazing. There's, I mean, Lviv that we're all hearing about today in the news. You know, Lviv is kind of the big center of Ukrainian diplomacy right now. It's where most of the embassies have evacuated to, and it's one of the far Western cities in the country. That town is absolutely beautiful. I mean, it's Austro-Hungarian influence and architecture, old cobblestone roads throughout the, the town. It's got the Solo Museum. It's a museum dedicated to pork fat, raw pork fat. That's like, a, <laughs> uh, yeah. and it's like, a, it's a mainstay of Ukrainian food and culture, Solo. And they have a whole museum dedicated to it there of the various different preparations and methods to eat it. it, it it's just amazing. It's one of the most beautiful Catholic and Orthodox churches, one of the oldest Jewish synagogues in the country that had to be rebuilt because the, the, the Germans burned it all the way down in the forties, but they've been able to revitalize it back to its near brick by brick former glory. And of course the Lviv chocolate factory in Lviv where they have the best chocolates, hot chocolate po Lvivsky. It's just absolutely decadent. And then of course, Odessa in the South, you've got the big town on the, on the Black Sea in the Southwest of the country. It's known as the, the city of humor. It's got a, a, a great theater where plays are shown. They've got uh, comedy clubs. Some, one of the best whiskey bars in the whole country is in Odessa, Corvin pub wall, I mean, floor to ceiling, wall to wall whiskey and leather clad chairs with a Ukrainian who speaks English just so eloquently with a little bit of a Scottish twist on him and he wears a kilt and he <laughs> knows everything there is to know about scotch. And it's just absolutely amazing. Every U S destroyer that would port in, in Odessa, we would bring the Naval attache and I would bring to Corvin pub and make sure they got a, a taste of the whiskey and an experience there. And it was just, just. Like I said, it's an amazing country to be in. And those were the, those were the major cities I spent my time in. You know, we had the rapid Trident army exercise in Lviv and we had the Seabreeze Navy exercise in Odessa. And that's where I spent most of my time. Hmm. Well, that place clearly made a tremendous impression on you. I can tell. Yeah. Four, four years. Yeah. <laughs> four years. Yeah. 
I've been to a few countries. I prefer to see them in the rearview mirror. You know, it doesn't seem like Ukraine is one of those, though. No, this is definitely not one of those countries. Honestly, the, the best parts of my life before, during, and after the revolution, all inclusive. I wouldn't give any of them up. Wow. Wow. That's quite an endorsement. So Shane, a minute ago, you mentioned the tremendous amount of government corruption that everybody was already dealing with. So it sounds like you had a, a very, I, I would call it a blissful period at the start of your tour, but when exactly did things start to take this, I guess I would call it like a revolutionary bent? Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was, it was quite a time there that was, it was just really the standard bit of corruption that was getting people on edge and, and really just kind of frustrated with the way things were going largely in the country with Yanukovych and his really blatant corruption, criminal enterprise. I mean, the man is essentially a career politician in the country. You know, he, he got his roots go, coming up in uh, Donetsk as the mayor and for years and years was a civil servant. And he was a multi-millionaire when he started running for the presidency. And, and it was just insane. And we can get into measure his estate that we got a nice little walk through the day after the government fell in February, a little bit later, but just the amount of corruption that he publicly displayed was just insane. One of the quotes that kind of teased it up nicely of how Yanukovych governs is Ambassador John Teft was the, the ambassador at the time, and he was having a meeting with Yanukovych. And they're sitting there discussing elections in general. And Yanukovych says, okay, so tell me this then, because the US was not recognizing the official outcomes of the election, because we had identified extensive bouts of voter fraud and, and would not certify the election results. And he said, what percentage of the vote would me or my party have to receive, receive in order for the United States to certify the election results? And Ambassador <laughs> Teff like, what? He's like, what, what, what's a number? 80? 85? Now, if we, if you look over to Russia for a second, like that's about like the voter, what elections are won by in Russia. So like, it, it, he literally thinks that this is an appropriate comment to make to the United States ambassador. And wow. you know, so that just kind of sets a little bit of his mindset governing and for diplomacy. But it was really, while it was a, a fire that was burning for quite a while and building up per se, it was definitely a defining moment. And it was Yanukovych's statement to the country that he was not going to be traveling to, I believe it was in Vilnius, to sign the EU trade agreement. And when he said that he was not going to go sign that trade agreement, the a large portion of the country kind of lost it. I mean, people were up in arms like, why would you not do this? This is going to bring European goods at good prices to Ukraine. We're going to be able to sell our goods at fair market value in the EU, reducing tariffs across the board. This is good for business. This is good for culture. This is good for the people overall. Why wouldn't you do this? And of course, some of the most activist people in any kind of political event are always going to be students, right? So a bunch of students mm -hmm. from the Lviv Polytechnic University traveled from Lviv to Kiev, and this was right around like U.S. Thanksgiving towards the end of November. And they went to Maidan Nezhelezhnosti, which is Independence Square, and they were just simply standing there, chanting, holding some signs. And the way that the Yanukovych government decided to do away with this protest was to send the Birkut Special Forces Riot Police with their sticks and shields and literally beat the kids out of the square and chase them up the hill to the top of St. Michael's Square. And that's that's quite a haul. I mean, that's a that's a very steep hill to run up, but they were beating kids all the way up that hill. And there's a lot of video footage out there of this. I mean, they're they're they were fracturing people's orbitals, their jaws, their shoulders, putting people in the hospital just to simply get them out of the square. And that is really what started what became the Euromaidan protest is what it started as. Hmm. Okay. And what, when was this exactly? What month? Uh, this was November. November. Okay. Yeah. So it was about November 30th was when the bear coot came in and beat the kids out of the square. So I, I believe they started there probably, you know, 28th, 29th, and they started standing up and around the square. 
Well, and I, I take it that this was a, a much different response than, than previous protests, because it seems like there's a pretty long history of a certain level of turmoil within Ukraine, what was my understanding, right? Like there's been many protests in the past. Was the Berkut much more forceful, I guess, this time with these students? Yeah, so certainly there's some comparisons you can draw between the Orange Revolution of 2008, I think, and Euromaidan. However, violence was, or sorry, 2004, the, the Rose Revolution was 2008 in Republic of Georgia. I was there too, not, not during for the revolution, but. So there, there are some similarities you can draw, but as, as I just kind of depicted there, the dealing with the Euromaidan, what became the Euromaidan protest st was started with violence by the Ukrainian government by just beating the kids out of the square. Because I think precisely right, as you infer here, they didn't want another Orange Revolution. Mm -hmm. And the Orange Revolution was about Yanukovych as well, is because he was largely seen to have stolen the election in 2004, winning out over Yushchenko. And then the Orange Revolution happened, the election was overturned, and then Yushchenko became the president of Ukraine. And Yanu obviously didn't want that to happen again. So yeah, he just decided to beat him out of the square. And it really kind of surprised a lot of us in the diplomatic community and watchdog organizations around the country. Not really the response we were expecting. And uh, an interesting time for me as well, my wife was giving birth in the US to our son in, in September. And I was, I was there for a couple of weeks, but then had to return back to Ukraine before they could rejoin me. And it took a couple of weeks, about six to six to eight weeks, I think, for my son to get his passport and his diplomatic visa back. Once that happened, she came back to Ukraine with her mother, and that was at this exact time. So as these students are protesting in Kiev Square, I'm driving with my family to Lviv just for a vacation, hmm. just to go hang out and, and enjoy a nice couple of days in Lviv. So it's, I believe it's the December 1st, I believe, and we're checking in or we're waking up after the a late check into the hotel in the morning and we're going out. We go down to the square and we drive into the square and there are thousands of people in the Lviv square where the, where the theater is. And there are convoys driving around honking their horns. There's a stage with people playing music. I mean, it is just, it, it is a really growing event that's happening in Lviv and it's a 100% peaceful, 100% cheerful. There are police there, but the police are simply just calmly standing there, just ensuring that there's no you know fights or anything breaking out. And there wasn't, you know, police are from the region that they're in. So these are Lviv oblast cops. That was the foundation of what would become the Euromaidan protest. And it started there in Lviv at the square. As I'm standing there looking at it with my wife, my newborn son, and my mother-in-law. Hmm. Wow. And this all sprung up like literally overnight, then I take it? Yes. I mean, it was happening in very you know, rapid succession. As I said before, you know, technology, especially like iPhone proliferation, wasn't really that much there. Smartphone proliferation wasn't really taking off a whole lot there. I did have a BlackBerry, but it's you know, your, your average U.S. government issue BlackBerry. So I'm not really getting alerts. I'm not really tuned into what's going on per se. So it had been brewing all night and I wasn't checking my emails. I was on leave. I was just trying to enjoy some time. And it really did come out of nowhere. We didn't really hear much of it when it had happened, mainly because I was on leave at the time, hmm. but that leave was immediately ended and I went into work mode. Oh yeah. And I separated from the family, told them to go back to the hotel and meet up with my contact there who would make sure that they were taken care of and entertained, but away from all of this, that started my observation of what would become the Euromaidan protests. Wow. And as you said, these start, well, they didn't start out, but the, the next day anyway was totally peaceful. So how did it escalate from that into like this continual violence that we saw play out over the next few months? Yeah. So, I mean, it's got to take it all in stride with being there was, it, it, it looked, it felt like it was a slow burn while we were there, but, you know, in research and looking back over it, you realize like, wow, so these dates are really close to one another, but really throughout the month of December, it was relatively peaceful. And, you know, as I said, the, the precedent for violence was set by the beer coot off the bat. So understandably, the protesters had a bit of frustration with the government. So there was some violence throughout December, but really it was 
a bit of rock throwing. So they were tearing up some of the cobblestone rows with tank bars. And, you know, there's a good palm sized rocks and stones and they're throwing them at the riot police and the riot police are, they're in full riot gear. They've got their shields, their helmets and everything. And they're in a phalanx and the processors would throw some rocks. And then some of the leaders would come out and, and yell at everyone to stop. At one point in December, protesters were able to get a, a piece of heavy equipment, like a, a, like a tram, a bucket loader. And they were trying to drive a bucket loader into riot police on the same street that the presidential administration building is on. And, you know, that sounds pretty major, but as we're all sitting there watching this, like, okay, well, it's, it's not really hit too much of a threshold yet. I mean, we didn't really concern ourselves at the embassy with evacuating quite yet. It wasn't really a, a revolution, really. It was just some people expressing their frustration at the way we saw it and the way it was escalating. And it would de-escalate from there. Vladimir and Vitaly Klitschko, uh, famous boxing brothers, they would get up and stand. They stood on top of the bucket loader and called for everyone to stop throwing rocks, to not um, give in to provocations and to de-escalate and handle this as peacefully as possible. So it was, like I said, a little bit of that kind of violence, but nothing to where the beer cooter coming out, hitting people in the head with sticks. The revolutionaries were largely peaceful. There was a front line maybe of a, a dozen or so who would start to throw rocks, but they would quite quickly be grabbed up by kind of your, your mainstream protesters and, and brought to the rear and dealt with accordingly, usually just the firm talking to and kind of cool down ban from the square until they were able to cool off. Wow. Wow. So like self-policing organization. Very much so. The life on Maidan, as it, as it grew into the, the actual Euro Maidan protest, it embodied really uh, Maidan Nezalezhnosti, the main Maidan square down on Kodashatik street, which is where most all of the photographs that you see for this revolution were from. It really was quite an organism to watch. There were huge tents of babushkas cooking borscht, Soryanik, all kinds of different stews and soups to feed the people. You would see people coming in after work on their way home and they were dropping off supplies for food, bread. There were young women walking around with plates of sandwiches and, and coolers of, or thermoses of warm kvass, which is a, a, a the typical drink in, in Ukraine. It's non-alcoholic, kind of like a beer, but non-alcoholic drink to warm them up. There were donations for clothes. There was money donations coming in as well. Cause a lot of people were just simply not working in order to be down there full time. And mm. it grew to just immense sizes. I mean, it started out as, I think the, the Lviv students was maybe like a hundred max students were there and it, maybe it surged like 200 at one time. And then you had Maidan at a pretty constant three to 5,000 surging up to over 50,000 at times. Wow. It was wow, wow. insane. And just to watch it all happen and the organization of, of Maidan was, was just a sight to be seen. They created self-defense forces based on a term of old Roman lineage of groups of 100 is what a Sotnia is. I mean, the salt, it's a declension from 100, but these, these groups were far less in size, probably your typical platoon size, maybe 30 to 40. And they had shields and you, you see the pictures and the videos of the shields, the protesters had, and these are not armored shields by any means, you know, any, any bullet from any gun is going to go through them. They're very thin, mainly to stop rocks and less than lethal rounds, but they had your typical Ukrainian military helmet, your, you know, camping camouflage type vest and boots and these shields, and they were training. They had people training them in formation, going over commands, how simply just to march as a unit, how to stand in a line, hold a phalanx. And all of this was completely self-organized. It was quite a thing to see. I can imagine. And you know, something that stood out to me, maybe not so significant for them, but all of this was taking place in what appeared to be like freezing temperatures the entire time that they were outdoors protesting for, for weeks and then months. Really, I mean, I was I was surprised at the grit that they showed, even if that is their home, for just staying out there through all that inclement weather that was clearly taking place. Yeah, it was it was a little cold, especially by U.S. standards. It was Fahrenheit. It was definitely in the twenties for a good bit of it, and getting down close to zero. Luckily, it wasn't that cold. 
in comparison. 2012 <laughs> was one of the coldest winters in a long time. I think it, I believe it set a record for the most days below zero Fahrenheit. It was like 40 some days was a record <laughs> in 2012. So it was quite fortunate the weather that they had there. And when it was oh, cold, right. yeah. And when it was cold, it played, it actually aided the protesters. So a big part of our job for observing the protests was just simply identifying places where checkpoints were, where buildup of protest forces and government forces were within the downtown area. And really that was to make sure that, because we still had people living there. So if you look on a map of where the protest was happening in the various protester locations, we still had people living in there. So we had to make sure that if people were going to be going to work that day, that they would know like, hey, there's a checkpoint here. You probably shouldn't come down this street. And a lot of these barriers were reinforced with ice. So as it was cold, the protesters would bag up bags of snow and they would build just like you would a sandbag wall, but with bags of snow. And then they would pour water on it. It would melt a little bit of snow and then it would all solidify back as ice. And then they had improvised hedgehogs that were reinforcing it as well as and any any other kind of dunnage you could think of, scrap wood, tables, chairs, they would chain everything together. And the cold and the ice is really what held a lot of those positions together throughout the bulk of um, January and February. So how quickly, I think you said uh, on the second day or, or the, the next day after the initial violence that you went into work mode, but did this immediately become like the number one priority for the attache office or did you have to continue preparing for the exercises like you had been doing as well before? I mean, all that work was still ongoing. It was kind of, for exercises, it was kind of the downtime was this time of year. So our planning conferences typically didn't start off until late winter, early spring anyway. So it was really just most of the work was being done by UCOM, not me. So it was really quite a fortunate time for this to all happen, let's say, just for my workload balance. But no, not immediately. We didn't really stand up into what would become, you know, the, the, the Kiev task force. And we didn't really set this out as kind of our permanent behavior quite yet. You know, through December, we, uh, a couple of us would go out there. Other embassy staff would go out and make observations, report back through to the embassy. And it, it really wasn't until another culminating moment was January 16th. Because every all the time in December and into the first half of January, it was just kind of like slow build out of Maidan. And slowly and slowly, roads were more like permanently closed by the protesters. You could no longer drive there and they build up defenses and barricades. And then the 16th, the Yanukovych administration had, instead of this time sending in the riot police to beat everyone out of the square, they decided that they would go the legislative route. So they signed into law what was known at the time of the anti-protest laws of January 16th. And if you look up some pictures from the time, and I remember getting emails from family members saying like, what is going on there? Like, why do I see Ukrainians wearing colanders on their head? And, <laughs> I, and people, take, they took it seriously. Like, you know, that doesn't, a colander doesn't protect you. I'm like, oh my God, like, no, that's, this is a joke to play into the anti-protest law because the law made it illegal essentially to protest. You couldn't stand in groups of more than, I believe it was like 10. You couldn't drive in groups of more than three because at the time they had Oftomandan as well, which was a convoy of cars that would drive around the Kyiv region, waving Ukrainian flags, banners for Euromaidan, yelling for Euro integration. And so the laws were passed to basically make it illegal for Euro Maidan to happen, illegal for Avto Maidan to continue, and it would be illegal to hold any kind of a weapon or shield and also to wear any kind of a helmet. So a lot of people took their helmets off and just put a piece of string through a colander and wore that. And oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And you, I think it was on the front page of many Western newspapers at the time. Like, what is this? A colander? And, and, and few journalists would actually get the, the point and, and read into that, that this was actually a further peaceful protest to the Ukrainian government by wearing a colander because a colander was not yet illegal. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's creative and it shows a lot of resilience <laughs> on their part as well, I think. Yeah. So, and really, and prior to this, I mean, Maidan was becoming more and more entrenched. However, 
activity was decreasing. A general sense of, of motivation throughout the square was low. We saw lower populations. We saw a, a heavy decrease in young population there. Cause you know, again, like if you're a, a young person, you know, 18 to, to 40, you had a job. So you had to get back to that job. And at the, the Ukrainian government was hoping, hoping that this would be a war of attrition and that simply it would fizzle out. And arguably, I would say it may have, it may have fizzled out, but then the Ukrainian government messed up again, just like it did when it beat the protesters out of the square in November, it signed these laws. And that is what enraged the people once again. And many thousands of people poured into the square and wearing their colanders, yelling at uh, the government line because the Ministry of Interior had barricaded their own streets to prevent you from going up to the parliament building, to prevent you from basically going up north of uh, Khrushchev Street. You couldn't go any, well, I think it was actually east, not north, but you couldn't go any further up the street. And during that weekend, I had actually decided that, okay, this was actually probably a decent time <laughs> in hindsight. I don't know why I had this idea, but I should probably take my wife out and show her the square because she had been living while only a mile away from the square where our apartment was. She never saw any of it. She'd only see it on TV hmm. and she really wanted to go take a look. So it was that weekend, the 19th, what became known as Black Sunday. And I arranged for a nanny to come over and watch our son. And I took my wife down there to the square and showed her around all the different tents. And we took lots of pictures and just kind of seeing it all for what it was. Sunset is, is coming in and we're, we go back to the car and we're driving around the corner to head back to the nannies to go pick up our son. And I noticed that where there was, uh, there's always been a ministry dump truck there with about five to six interior troops, just kind of nonchalantly standing there as they had been for weeks. But as we're driving back up this road, they are all turtle shelled in the back of the dump truck with their shields in a full phalanx. Hmm. Now, you know, red flag starts to raise. Okay, something is going on here. And I look, I check my phone. I got nothing. I got no emails. I've got no text messages from anyone else that, that anything is, is going on at all. So I immediately stop the car. I get out. I tell my wife to go pick up, the, pick up her son, go home and just button down and call, call the embassy to see if they have any further guidance. But I've got to go. Luckily, I was dressed for the occasion. We were out. It was it was cold that day. I think it was probably like 25, 30 degrees. And I was in I was in boots. I had thermal underwear. I had snowboarding pants on, a jacket, everything. So I was I was pretty ready to go. And I start asking these Ukrainians who were standing next to the dump truck, like, hey guys, like what's going on? He's like, Oh my God, you haven't heard? No. It's like the the protesters at Dynamo Stadium, two blocks away, are storming the lines. There's like 10,000 people over there. And immediately I just start running the couple of blocks to get over there to take a look. And as soon as I round the corner, thousands of protesters had just beat through the ministry line and overturned a truck and screaming, throwing rocks, government troops, an organized retreat, backing up, backing up slowly, essentially to the back gate of Dinamo Stadium to hold a line there. And I start firing off messages to the Kiev task force and starting to report what's going on. Very quickly, I find out that there's another one of us out there as I, the more messages start coming in on the task force distro. And it's my colleague, the Marine attache. So who would have thought that on a Sunday when, you know, we're usually not working as the revolution is coming out and becoming kinetic, the two people in the office are the Marines. <laughs> I'll bet so. You guys are there within like minutes of this breaking out. Both of you are on the ground and reporting immediately. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of went this a similar fashion. So my colleague, he's in a book that I'll go ahead and, and quote in a little bit. Luckily, this book just came out so I can talk a lot about it because this book went through review. He was out there because he kind of thought that some things were going to go down, you know, reading the sentiment of the people and the law that was just passed. So he was already out and about. I knew that if I was going to show my wife, my Don, that it kind of had to be now or never. So we were both kind of out there because we felt that something may be coming, but maybe it was okay for right now to be out there. And that's just, I mean, maybe we were drawn to it. Maybe it's just a sixth sense Marines have that there's about to be a fight and we should be there. But there we were and protesters were running up the street. They were turning over a truck. They had Molotov cocktails. They were, they lit the truck on fire and immediately 
we realize that this is we're, we're we have escalated and we're never going backwards again like we've just entered mm -hmm. a new phase and this is was known as black sunday mainly because they started tire fires on this day so there was mountain of maybe 20 30 tires and that fire started and that really lit the war fire for this to happen and the battle drum set in you had probably two to five thousand pensioners women kind of non-participants in the act of fighting but they were in the square and they all had some piece of metal that they could find some metal of opportunity and they were banging it on trash can lids street poles whatever they could find but these thousands of people were doing so in unison just dong 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 and it was deafening in the square and it it really felt like you were inside of a movie that had a soundtrack and scored with everything going on around you it was quite amazing to to see this jump off on bloody sunday well i can imagine did it feel as historic as it was in the moment do you think it did so i there's some other comments that i i hope i'll be able to get down in a book in the future but there were some comments that i had made on this day to some other members other defense officials to that exact tone that this is different this is time sensitive and things are happening right now and i don't think everyone was taking it as seriously as they should have and that's all i can really say on it right now mm, i got it but but yeah as you're sitting there you know it's all it's all in minor escalations but this one was different this one was definitely different it was mainly the mood and the sentiment you know the sentiment was usually a couple of kids in masks throwing some rocks and there was always the conspiracy theory that that was a ukrainian security service agent who was trying to pretend to be a protester and throw rocks just to delegitimize you know or most likely it was probably just a punk kid who was there to get some frustration out and thought it would be cool to throw a rock and they would be quickly swept away and now you had hundreds of people who look like nor they weren't the your 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 kids your tatushki was a word that was thrown around a lot tatushki is a word for kind of a like a punk kind of like a criminal a criminal punk it wasn't that it was normal businessmen it was taxi drivers you know just normal everyday ukrainians who had had enough and they were the ones standing in the front lines they were the ones who were breaking apart the road running forward stones from the cobblestone road in baskets to the front line who were manning it there, there was a fountain it was empty of course because it was winter but the fountain was full of empty glass bottles and jugs of gasoline and ripped up clothes and there was a molotov cocktail assembly line happening there and and all of this was just i mean as far as we could tell it was completely almost without vocal communication it was just all happening almost as if it was one organism and the whole wow. thing was communicating with itself and and it moved like an organism too and there's some videos uh, that i could share as well to kind of depict the fighting line of kind of a wave in the ocean of it would would wave forward with an assault of rocks and then the bear coot would kind of push back and then it would it would go on that cycle every few minutes yeah, we're very lucky. You said it is before the, the iPhone era, kind of, but we're very lucky. There is some absolutely incredible electrifying footage from all of this that I've, I've seen online and documentaries and that kind of thing. And I'm really grateful for that because it is it, it seemed like a one of a kind event, honestly. And just the tremendous violence of the Berkut is caught on camera and the, the people all rallying together and just some really amazing stuff to see. It's very clear that it was not a bunch of, you know, semi-professional troublemakers putting everything together. It was a bunch of normal people young up to old who all came together, you know, for one purpose here. It's quite amazing to see. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't mind, if I could read a small passage from a book that was just published. Yeah, please go ahead. All right. So this book written by a colleague of mine, Christopher Smith, and it's called Ukraine's Revolt, Russia's Revenge. And I read to you a passage. And this passage is a, a written quote that I had sent into the embassy within these days. It was, I think it was January 20th or 21st. I said, it is quite demoralizing to make the walk from Maidan to Hurush, uh, short for Hrushevskova. It is like walking into a new universe. Maidan is well lit, 
well-fed, warm, full of entertainment and recreation. Rounding the now dormant Dnipro Hotel, you notice all light is being sucked into the black hole of tire fires. I assume it is similar to crossing the river Styx, but in this scenario, Haron is paid in air sacs from your lungs as black smoke fills the air. Maidan is a four-star hotel compared to how life is on Hrushevskova. The war drumming started at 1745, with no violent intentions noticed, just a remotivating of the troops. And that was a normal evening for me in late January of 2014. Hmm. Walking into the middle of the, gosh, I don't even know what I call it, the eye of the storm. Maybe it really sounds like a little bit of a it, world. It really was. I mean, as, as I tried to depict there for, and, and that was mainly for an email that was created to go to the White House to keep them in, up to speed with everything that was happening minute by minute. And it was really just to kind of say that you, it's hard to tell that this is a city in revolt. And merely half a mile away, it looks like just a peaceful protest and some people are sure standing in the middle of a road on a, in a tent making stew, but it, it's really hard to tell what you would see around the corner, which is hundreds of feet tall, thick black smoke, which is hidden by large buildings. And it's really hard to tell, especially in the evening, that something is happening down there. And yeah, to us and everyone living there, it was like, okay, this is just life in Kiev. We go out and we observe the protests for you know 12 hours and then I go back home. Except this day was a little bit different. On that day... And, you know, the river sticks was, it was a real reference to a, a river of just black as snow was melting from the tire fires and carrying with it just the thickest black water you can imagine all the way down the road into Euro square. And I stood up there just observing this organism wave of going back and forth of the protests. And I was standing in the media circle. This was a circle of many people wearing fluorescent vests that said press. There was yellow tape around. This little concrete platform is maybe 10 feet by 15 feet that we were standing on. And we're, we're simply just standing there observing what's going on, documenting it, recording it. So clearly we are not part of the protest. And there were a series of you know, riot grenades going off, tear gas, less than lethal rounds being fired against particular protesters. And all of a sudden I'm just standing there and my world goes black. I, I am completely and utterly disoriented. I, I realize that my mouth is open. I, I know that I'm still here, but I, I can't move. I can't see. I, I don't even know if I'm laying down or standing up. And I start to gain some sense of awareness and I can't really feel much of what's going on in my body. And I, I look down and my arm is kind of in a very weird position. It's not bent backwards or anything, but it, it's just bent and conformed in a way that just doesn't look very natural. And I'm, I'm stumbling away from this square and I can't hear anything. Everything is loud, whiny. It's a little hard to breathe. And as I start to become more aware, I realized that we had just been hit by a riot grenade. And there were various levels of riot grenades. I was observing Tedien was the manufacturer of the riot grenades they were using. And through the, the, the evidence that I had picked up and there were certain levels of these riot grenades and the riot grenades were normally level threes, maybe some fives. The riot grenade that just went off next to me was a seven. Mm, wow. And the decibel level is equivalent to a seven, uh, the jet engine on a 747 at full blast and you're standing right next to it. That's the sound decibel level. And it has pieces of graphite shrapnel and CS gas that, that erupts out of it. So we're hit with this. Everyone's stumbling away. My weird looking arm is due to a piece of the shrapnel hit the my elbow and directly impacted the ligaments there in the nerve center and just forced my arm to completely retract. And I couldn't even, I couldn't move it if I wanted to. And it was like that for a couple of minutes. I couldn't hear very disoriented for at least a couple of minutes. Luckily, my active duty career kind of established a certain CS gas just didn't really affect me as much as it may mm. the, the normal person. So that really wasn't quite as bad, but that was quite a hit. And I believe my testimony there was some of the evidence used in the international courts later on against the Yanukovych government for improper policing of peaceful protests and some of the convictions they had there. The damage wasn't really fully known to me until I got home that night, maybe two o'clock in the morning, 
I get back home, I get in the door, my wife is, is there to greet me. And, you know, she's like, I mean, she's pulling our family together, like the, like the, the mother and, and matriarch of our family that she is. Our, our son is, you know, trying to sleep. She's waking up with him. She's there disrobing me as I come in, got hot something, hot chocolate probably for me as I wait. And she's helping me pull down my pants and she notices, she's like, what is this? And there's a hole in my pants and there's blood just running down my leg and filling up my boot. I didn't even know. And a piece of that shrapnel actually went into my leg and I was bleeding most of the night, but didn't even know it. Wow. Wow. Still got a little scar to this day. It's not too bad. Nothing, nothing major, nothing lasting other Jeez. than a memory. And that was another kind of changing moment in the protests was the increased use of less than lethals and the increase to large format riot grenades for dispersing small groups. And specifically in that case, reporters and press. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that's a tremendous escalation there. And you said earlier you did four tours in Iraq, I think, and then you come to Kiev and that's where you get wounded yep. there. That's uh, that's unexpected, yep. I have to admit. Yep, no Purple Hearts for, for on my chest. And then I go to Ukraine and yeah, I am bloody and very minorly Jeez. scarred. Jeez, that's unexpected. So I was just going to ask you how close to the fighting you, you were and clearly you were within throwing distance <laughs> of it. So very close. Were there any, yes. I guess I call it like rules of engagement for you guys when you went out? I mean, did they just say observe and report, get as close as you can? Or were there any like lines like do not go past this block on the street or anything like that at all? I mean, it was, sounds like a very fluid situation, of course. It was very fluid. So the only order that was really given out by the ambassador was to everyone who was not the DAO. Mm. So if you were not in, and this, I believe that probably came down shortly after Black Sunday. But if you were not in the DAO, you were not allowed to be down there. Okay. Only DAO members were allowed to be there. Yeah, whereas you're exactly where they need you. Right. And as I said earlier, the, you know, the publicly stated mission of a defense attache office is to observe and report events happening in the country and to inform senior U.S. leaders. And so we were conducting our job to do so. And really, we were, we were the ones who would make that call. So we would be the ones internally to decide whether or not we should be there and what essentially lines of contact we should abide by. And when I say we, it was, it was the defense attache and, and his normal deputy, which is the senior army attache, both 06s. That didn't happen quite yet in January. That came later in February. This concludes part one of my interview with Shane Partlow. Part two will debut on Monday, April 11th, 2022. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes a free PDF copy of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Jack T. and William M. With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.